My name is Marcus Stevens. I'm the regional manager for 911 Wildlife. Um, our company was founded in 2006 by wildlife rehabbers to kind of stave off the influx of orphaned babies that they were getting in because each rehabber was getting in about 200 orphan babies a baby season, each baby season. And that's just way too much because rehabbers, they pay for everything out of their pocket, you know, and 25, 30 babies is normal. And they started to get 200 or more of these babies. So, and 90% of it was due to trapping because said people would set traps, trap the mama, take it off and not realize there was babies in their attic or somewhere else. And they didn't know what to do. So those babies didn't have a choice, but to go to a rehabber. So that's why we were founded and we exist. So anything that we do is going to be based on that principle. We are also the only wildlife control company in the state of Texas that's endorsed by the Humane Society. So everything that we do is governed, you know, under what they consider humane. We don't just walk around saying, yes, we're a humane wildlife control company. We have an endorsement. Um, we've had a, city, a contract with the city of Dallas for the last five years and we handle all of their wildlife issues. So, and that's been a real plus for them. So their animal services can focus on dogs and cats. Um, so today we're gonna talk about coyotes and bobcats. The PowerPoint's just bobcats, but the information for coyotes and bobcats is 100% interchangeable. So everything I tell you about a bobcat is gonna go true with a coyote with some small differences that I will cover. What we're gonna go over is intuition versus science. What do you feel is the right reaction when you see a, a bobcat or a coyote versus what science says is the correct way to deal with a sighting? All right, fears versus facts. The coyotes and bobcats are not gonna come eat your kids. They do not, coyotes do not come and actively stalk your pets normally. So bobcats are cats, cats are carnivores, and they do sport hunt, so there is that possibility. But we can also tell you how to keep your pets safe from a bobcat or a coyote. And why, can you tell me, I'll ask you, why do you think there's bobcats inside the city? Oh, they used to live here. They used to live here? Anybody else want to chime in? because there's food, yep. The bobcats have always been here. So nothing of that has ever changed. The reason we see more of them now is number one, everybody has cameras on their houses. So you know what's going on when you're not there and you're amazed that all of these animals are walking through your yard and it doesn't matter if it's nighttime or daytime. So, and number two is we have conditioned them that it is okay to be in our presence. Because what is the first thing you do when you see a coyote or a bobcat? You pull out your phone and take pictures, or you back off. You just don't, or you don't do anything. You just look at it. That is not top of the food chain behavior because we are top of the food chain. And when we act like it, they respect it. But we haven't act like it in many, many years. So it's not a big deal to them to be in our presence. You know, that you're walking down the sidewalk, there could be a coyote laying in somebody's front yard under a tree. You might not ever even see them. And you just walk 10 feet from them. They don't care. You're not a threat to them because we've shown them that. Well, part of what we're gonna go over today is how to change that behavior. The coyotes and the bobcats are not gonna leave your neighborhoods. There's no way we could possibly ever get rid of them all. And you wouldn't want to because of their diets, what they eat, the services they provide to our ecosystem. So with that being said, we're also gonna go over the bad news, what doesn't work and the good news and what does work. As our urban habitat expands, a lot of the native species begin to disappear or they adapt. There is a few species that adapt. It says a few up there, it's way more than a few, but all of these animals have adapted to live in and around us and are actually thriving. So it's, they've taken it and made it a positive that we're expanding all this urban habitat because now they depend on us to build urban habitat. 
All of these animals are city animals now. You can't take them to the country and let them go because they don't know how to live in the country. Because it's been multiple generations at this point that they've lived in the city. Bobcats, 15 to 25 pounds. A 25 pound bobcat is a really big cat if you're not ready to see it. <laughs> People say they look like they weigh 50 pounds, you know, and they are tall and lanky. Their diet is 100% meat, cats are carnivores. They eat mice, rats, squirrels, and rabbits. And they will come after outdoor cats because it's competition. Why wouldn't they? If you have an outdoor cat, it's part of mother nature. It is in the circle of life and it is subject to those laws. If you have an indoor cat that gets outside, you should get it back inside as quick as you can. I'm not saying every single time a bobcat is going to actively seek out people's cats and kill them. No, but it does happen. They are not a threat to children. They will not come get your kids. And the best analogy for that is, is if you see a baby bear cub, what do you do? Better yet, what do you don't do? You don't go over there and play with it because you know mama's around and you're no longer top of the food chain. The same thing goes for them when they see our kids. They know mom and dad are around somewhere and it's not gonna turn out well if they come after it. There has never been a documented bobcat, wild bobcat attack. So, on a child. People that get attacked by bobcats are people that do what we do, because we're the ones getting hands on with them when we absolutely have to, and turkey hunters because turkey hunters are camouflaged head to toe, sitting in a bush and squawking like a turkey. And it's more of a surprise than really an attack. So that's, that's really the only people that should be worried about it, and most of them don't. Can y'all see what he's sitting under? That's a bird feeder. That is McDonald's drive through for wildlife. <laughs> Bird feeders feed the birds, but they also feed the rats. What is one of the main staples of a bobcat is rats. So all he's got to do is sit at this bird feeder and he will absolutely catch a rat. Bobcats, they can have, usually it's around up to four kittens, you know, and they stay with mom for a long time and learn how to hunt and and all of that. Coyotes, on the other hand, they mate for life. They're mated pairs, but they don't stay together the whole time. So around February 14th, they've came back and reestablished pair bonds, and that's when they start mating again. April, the pups are born, and so that's when you hear everything start getting really loud. And then all through the summer, and you very well might see five or six coyotes running around they're not hunting in a pack. That's mom and dad and their pups that they are training how to hunt. There's no animals here that are big enough that they have to hunt in a pack. So with the coyotes, you'll see them all the way up through September, you know, beginning of October, and then they will push their young ones out. And then after that happens, mom and dad split back up until the next February into January, beginning of February. So they're not all always together. So this picture was actually taken in Frisco, like in 2012. These popcats were at the end of a cul-de-sac, minding their own business. And when I pulled in there, I was actually doing a squirrel job on a house. And everybody came out and said, are you here for the bobcats? And I was like, no. And they're like, good, leave them alone. So that was good. But we went ahead and educated everybody on bobcats and why they were beneficial. You know, a bobcat can eat 15 to 20 rats a night. So, I mean, that's way better free pest control than anybody could hope for. And they don't, they're not going to do damage to your house or anything. You all know what this is, right? Is that humane? It's called a have a heart trap. Anybody? I'm going to make y'all participate because there's not too many people in here. 
Yeah, that's the way we've been doing it for forever, right? Science has actually taught us that it is not humane. It is one of the worst things you can do because it's a lot slower. That's a 100% mortality rate in unfamiliar territory. And let's take a squirrel, for instance. If you trap a squirrel and you take it to the park and let it go, how many other squirrels are in that park? A lot. Squirrels are territorial. They fight to the death over territory. So now this squirrel that you trapped is stressed, dehydrated, and in unfamiliar territory and just got thrown into a fight. He's setting him up for failure. And a lot of times they injure themselves in the trap trying to get out. So now they're injured, stressed, dehydrated, and in unfamiliar territory and have to fight. So yes, we are setting them up for failure. The other thing is, is where do you think everybody else goes that has trapped a squirrel to release them? In that same park. <laughs> so you're compounding other problems doing it also. So instead of trapping and relocating and trap or trapping at all, let's figure out why they're doing what they're doing and how to stop it. You also run the risk of orphaning babies. Now, is trapping effective? It might not be humane, but does it work? I mean, in the urban environment versus rural environment, the population densities are, densities are about 50 times more dense inside the city than they are in the country. So the populations are 50 times higher than they are in the country. Do you really think that you're gonna trap all of the 10,000 squirrels in your neighborhood? No, it's, it, that's not a realistic expectation. And you only have one, maybe four or five squirrels if you have a mom and juveniles on your house at a time. That's it. So if you've trapped you know, 63 squirrels since January, your trapping is not working because you didn't have 63 squirrels at the beginning of the year. You only had one at a time. And the more you trap, the more Mother Nature is going to fill that void. She hates a vacuum. And since the population density are so, so high, you get less time in between territorial openings. So whereas in the country, if you trap something and take it away, you could get a month, you could get years before another one comes back. In the city, you're looking at hours or days. And it is a waste of time of taxpayers' money and your money because it doesn't work. You're not doing anything. All it does is it makes people that are ignorant to the fact that it doesn't work feel better. When's the last time y'all saw one of those? <laughs> It's a typewriter if you don't know. Do y'all know what they have in common? Hush. <laughs> They're antiquated. Yeah, they're obsolete. However, a typewriter still has its place, which is why I've used one. <laughs> Traps still serve a purpose. If an animal is sick, injured, or deemed dangerous, that's the only way we have to deal with it. So they still serve a small purpose, just not as a broad use that we think that they should be used for. Effective solutions. And so instead of trapping, well, what can you do? The number one thing you can do is restrict their food supplies. Now with coyotes and bobcats, that's a little easier than it is with a squirrel. Because if you have a con tree in your yard, an oak tree, you know, you're not gonna restrict your squirrel's food supply, let's be honest. But if you have a bird feeder, you can absolutely restrict that. Or if you feed dogs and cats outside and don't pick up the food, you can restrict that. Now, with coyotes and bobcats, restricting their food supply means restricting what they eat, their food supply. So rats, squirrels, you know, to a point, and stuff like that. So if you can cut down on the rat food, you will cut down on the reason for coyotes and bobcats being in your yard. Um, if you're feeding dogs and cats outside, you should pick the food up and don't leave it out. And, you know, that's, that's another big attractant. Um, unpicked up dog feces, rats love that. And if you're pulling rats in your yard, you're drawing everything else that eats rats. Eliminating access to den sites. If you have a shed, a deck, you know, a big hole under the side of your house, you know, anything like that, you should be aware of it 
and try to monitor and see what's going on. What is it? Is it an armadillo? Is it a skunk? Is it a coyote or bobcat? Coyotes not so much will build or den in and around people. Bobcats will absolutely make a den under your deck or under a shed because they're cats. That's what they do. They don't care. So, but the bob or the coyotes, they're a little bit more skittish around their den sites. They don't want to be around us. Adversion techniques. This is where the fun part comes in. So remember when I said the first thing anybody ever does when a coyote or bobcat is seen is they pull out their cell phones and they take pictures or they back off and they don't do anything. Well, aversion techniques, the best thing you can do is haze them. So in hazing, and we'll get much more in depth in it here in a minute, is you're just gonna scare them off, but you have to be aggressive towards them. Now this is for coyotes and bobcats. Don't think you can haze a raccoon or a squirrel or anything because it's not going to work. And absolutely never try to haze a stray dog because they do not have an inherent fear of people and they probably won't run from you. You know, or there's a greater chance that they won't run from you. So we're going to get into restricting their food supplies. Y'all can see what's on the ground right there, right? That's all bird seed. And you have one rat eating, and one's being a lookout. So rats are smart. I mean, they're not, they've made it this far not, by not being dumb. So if you can, bird feeders are the number one attractants into people's yards. People throw a bunch of bird seed out there and they think that it's great and they're watching the birds and all of that. They don't understand everything else they're feeding. So and that's part of why we want to educate on that. I'm not saying you have to stop feeding your birds. You just have to do it a little bit more carefully. So you have to bring in the bird seed at night. You have to put a drop tray down. So all of the stuff that they drop falls into a tray that you can empty every day. This is a diagram. We can email it to you. It just goes over real quick, you know, the, the hot spots in and around your house, on your house that you should be aware of that wildlife will take advantage of. Keeping your pets safe, your dogs and cats. The general rule is anything under 20 pounds is fair game. However, coyotes, I'm not saying they don't ever do this, but as a rule of thumb, they do not actively seek out your dogs to get. But I've never seen a Yorkie, a Maltese, a Chihuahua that did not have little dog syndrome and was the biggest, baddest thing ever and will chase anything. So if it's not on a leash and you're out walking it or it's on a 25 foot retractable leash and you're out walking it and it smells, sees a coyote or bobcat, it's going to run after it. Now the, that animal's not gonna necessarily run from it. Why would it? It's this teeny tiny little snack. So that's not them hunting your dog. That is an opportunistic you know, meal for them. So they're not gonna pass it up. And if they are on a 25 foot retractable leash and they run 20 feet into the brush, that is not a coyote attacking your dog on a leash while you're walking it. Because that coyote has no idea that that dog is associated with you. Or the bobcat. So, you know, you can't, people misinterpret that all the time saying the coyote came and took my dog off a leash well, no, you had a 25 foot retractable leash and you never even saw the coyote. So how's that? That's not fair to them. And it makes them look a lot worse than what really happened. And your cats, the best way to keep a cat safe is keep it inside. That's it in a nutshell. If you have an outdoor cat, coyotes don't like to go after outdoor cats because they're outdoor savvy cats, they have their claws and they know how to survive and they fight back. And coyotes don't want stuff that fights back. They want the easy meal. Bobcats on the other hand, they, you know, they will kill it over territory. They'll, you know, run it off, you know, whatever they need to do. But it's not like they actively go on cat killing sprees or anything like that. It's just if the opportunity presents itself. 
eliminating access to dune sites. This is a, actually they lived in Coppell, um, had a family of bobcats under their deck, and, but they didn't have any dogs, they didn't have any cats, they didn't have any grandchildren, they didn't have anything except their backyard, so they opted to leave them there and just took a whole bunch of pictures and the, the best statement was it's National Geographic on our back window. So they got to watch them grow up and everything. But you know what? They didn't have any rats. They didn't have any squirrels. They didn't have any rabbits for that time being. As soon as the bobcats left, of course, all that came back. The way that we eliminate access to dense sites, and we'll tell you, show you how to do it, is this. It's called the L-shaped barrier. To seal a deck, a shed, anything to keep an animal from digging, this is the absolute best way to do it. It is a lot of work, but you only have to do it once. They've never, and an L-shaped barrier installed correctly has never been defeated in my knowledge because every animal walks right up to the edge and starts digging down. And there's wire buried in an L, so they dig down and hit the bottom of the wire. And instead of going back away from the edge and digging down, they just move down the line and hit wire and hit wire until they give up. So that's why it's an effective barrier. Um, if we also, we use one-way doors to exclude animals from their den sites. So in conjunction with the L-shaped barrier. So if you do have a skunk, armadillo, a coyote den, bobcats, whatever, we can install one-way doors over their holes and make sure they can't get past it with the L-shaped barrier. And that way when they come out, they can't get back in. And we use that for squirrels and raccoons and everything else too, it works great. As long as there's no babies, it works like a champ. If there is babies, then we put the babies on the outside so mama can get them. So adversion techniques, hazing. When you see a coyote or bobcat, hazing is your best friend. You will never have to haze a coyote more than twice. And you probably have to haze a bobcat a little bit more because they are cats, like I said. Um, but no more than three or four times would you ever have to haze a bobcat. The whole point in hazing is to make it uncomfortable to be around us again. And they need to associate this action with us doing it. So you can't hide and do it. You have to be up front in their face and do it. So, and you can get a water gun, a whistle, air horn, pots and pans, you know, anything that makes a lot of loud noises and scream and yell at them and be aggressive towards them. That is, that's what you want. You want this behavior. So, cause that is a life changing traumatic experience for them. And if you shoot one with a water gun, they're not going to stop and turn around and be like, why are you shooting me with a water gun? It's a water gun. Who cares? No, it's the apex predator just made contact with me, which means you can kill them at any time you want. That's how they view it. So it is a life changing experience for them. And they're, they're not, they're not going to run off and just leave town. They're just not going to let us see them anymore, which is what we want because then there's no coyote, bobcat, human encounter. They're not going to be so quick to go lay down in your front yard. They're not going to be jumping in your backyard because it's yours. Now you took it back. So, that, and that's what we want to accomplish with that. Super soakers, don't get the little rinky dink water guns. If you're gonna use one, get a real super soaker that, cause those have like 30, 40 foot range on them. And you, it doesn't have to hit them real hard, but it does need to hit them. And they will absolutely leave every time. So, and it doesn't matter what you're wearing. We have some slides of a lady wearing a dress and heels, hazing a coyote. So it's not an excuse. You can still do it. It's going to be unnerving the first time you have to do it, I'm sure. But the coyote or bobcat will not be aggressive towards you. They will run from you every single time. There's a lot of raccoons in the city for the same reason about the bobcats and the coyotes. There's food. People feed them. And the bad thing about feeding wild animals is you, that is the main way how diseases get spread. 
Because if you have one raccoon that's coming up to a feeding station like this, and there's probably 40 raccoons coming here, if one of them has distemper, the chances of it going like wildfire through that whole entire, you know, clan of raccoons is very good. You know, so instead of having one dead raccoon, now you've got 40. And no telling how many other raccoons they pass it on to. So that's one reason why not to feed them. The other reason not, why not to feed them is you're giving them a sustainable, reliable food source that's higher in nutritional value than they're used to that they do not have to work for. So Mother Nature says, oh, well, there's plenty of room in this territory and plenty of food in this territory. Let's up the population again. So they have more babies more often. And the survivability rate of their babies goes way up because they're so, their food is so nutritional. So, and then when you stop it, the extra ones will disperse. So that's why you don't feed them. And, and this goes right back to Frisco, fed animals are the ones that attack and are aggressive towards people. If they associate people with food, those are the ones that will come bite you because they come up to you expecting you to feed them and you've never seen this raccoon before in your life. And he's like, feed me. And you're like, no, I don't have anything. That's when he gets aggressive. Possums, y'all have seen possums, right? Yes. Possums are my favorite thing to talk about. Possums are the most awesome animal you could have in your yard. <laughs> they are immune to parvo, distemper, and rabies. There's no such thing as a rabid possum. Here's the disclaimer, you can give any mammal rabies in a lab. However, the conditions will very rarely ever exist and coincident in time with each other and all the planets are aligned for a possum to get rabies. It's not gonna happen. You know, maybe you got a better chance of winning the mega millions. So that's one good thing. The second good thing is, is they love to eat venomous snakes and they are immune to venomous snakes. So they, you know, they're out there cleaning your copperheads up, which is, and they eat rats and they eat carry on, which is dead things. That's their main staple. So they're the little vultures that walk on the ground. They're cleaning up after us. They don't do damage to your house. They're not ripped, they're ripping holes in your siding and stuff like that. They just find little areas to live in. If they are in your attic, it's because another animal, a raccoon or a squirrel, made a hole that they use. So, but they are just mean enough, raccoons won't kick them out. So, but they coexist with animals just fine too. They are North America's only marsupial. They have Jill's, Jack's, and Joey's, just like kangaroos. Their babies are born in a pouch. They can have up to 10. When they're all too big to stay in the pouch, they ride on our back like the very first picture. When they're all too big to stay on her back and they fall off, that's their cue to leave. A viable baby possum is, not including the tail, about seven inches, which is the palm to your middle finger. If he's that big, he's perfectly fine on his own. They only live to be about 18 months old. What makes them immune to parvo distemper and rabies is their body temperature is only 94.4 degrees. So that's too low to incubate anything. They have an unusual defense strategy. Has everybody ever come across a possum? The first thing they do is they are the biggest, baddest thing ever. They have a great bluff. They smile, they hiss, they salivate. They make you not want to be around them. <laughs> if that doesn't work, then what do they do? They play dead and they are really good at it. That's the whole playing possum. And he's not dead. <laughs> This is what their feet look like. They have just about as close to opposable thumbs as you can get, which means they're extremely good climbers. And I know if you've seen one, they look slow and clumsy and all of that, but they can be really fast. They're not uncoordinated and slow. And if you ever try to run one down, you'll figure that out. <laughs> Same thing goes for all of these, restrict their food supplies. If, they, if you have any animals getting on your roof, the first thing you should look at is the branches and trees around your house. If you can have your trees trimmed, it's not gonna solve it, but it will help. It's just one more tool in your tool bag, you know, to make your house a little harder to be on. 
but yes. Yep. So we recommend six feet. If it's not feasible, then it's not feasible. But I mean, like raccoons and squirrels and possums, they crawl upside of your brick. They'll go up the gutters. You know, it's physically impossible to keep them off of your roof. But as long as your trees are trimmed, it's just, it makes it a little harder. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs>